Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, fuel fears. A major U.S. pipeline shut down after a cyber attack. And now gas prices are on the rise. The investigation underway as concerns grow over the possible long-term effects. Off the track, a Hall of Fame horse trainer indefinitely suspended after Kentucky Derby winner Medina Spirit failed a drug test. A look at what happens now with the big race just days away. Decline in demand. Several states scaling back on their orders of the coronavirus vaccine. The area is making the most progress as officials consider more changes to mask wearing guidelines. And crash landing. NASA criticizing China's space agency after debris from one of their rockets crashed down to Earth. Why some fear next time it won't land in the ocean. That was a big one. I know quite a few people were tracking over the weekend. Yeah, a little bit of a relief. At least it didn't land on land. So yeah, absolutely. Good. Right in the ocean. Best place for it. We'll tell you more on that in just a little bit. First, though, we're going to begin. The Department of Transportation has issued an emergency declaration for 17 states and D.C. after one of the country's biggest fuel pipelines went offline following a ransomware attack. Friday night's cyber attack on Colonial Pipeline is already causing fuel prices to jump. But experts say gas prices at the pump should hold steady if the pipeline returns to normal in the next few days. NBC News White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell has more on the attack and the fallout. A complex and sinister mystery. This is one of my worst nightmares come to light. A crippling cyber attack that forced a major U.S. energy pipeline offline Friday. Cyber intruders inserted ransomware inside systems of energy giant Colonial Pipeline, making demands for payment. You're holding a major component of the United States infrastructure hostage for ransom. Colonial Pipeline delivers 100 million gallons a day of gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and home heating oil through a 5,500-mile system on the East Coast. This attack alarming many officials. The implications for this for our national security um, cannot be overstated. Underway this weekend, an emergency response across the U.S. government, Homeland Security, the FBI, Department of Energy, and more. It's an all-hands-on-deck effort right now, and we are working closely with the company, state and local officials to, you know, make sure that they get back up to normal operations. Experts say this cyber attack moved to a new level. This is the biggest attack that involved vital infrastructure. Filling your tank, other critical supplies could be at risk. Experts say that depends on how severe the damage done and how long it takes to secure the compromised systems. It's a top priority for the administration. Unfortunately, these sorts of attacks are becoming more frequent. The company, Colonial Pipeline, says while its four main lines remain out of service, some smaller parts of its operation have been restored. White House officials tell me they have set up an interagency working group to respond to this crisis. One step taken by the Department of Transportation, allowing some flexibility in work rules so that truckers can transport some needed fuel in key states. Savannah? NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now. So, Ken, first of all, what are security officials saying about who may have carried out this attack? Good morning, Joe. Well, two sources familiar with the matter tell NBC News that a Russian criminal group known as Dark Side is the leading suspect. And there's some reporting that they may have even taken responsibility. They are fairly open about the fact that they're an extortion business uh, and what I'm being told is that this is not being looked at as a nation state attack. This is not the Kremlin attacking the United States. But these are Russian hackers that are essentially harbored by Russia. They are allowed to operate unmolested and attack the West. And look, ransomware goes on all the time. In fact, there's a hospital system right now in San Diego that is locked up in a ransomware attack. But this is the biggest, most serious and far reaching ransom attack, perhaps in modern history, Joe. Ken, I know the FBI said that it's working with the company and with government partners. So what happens from here? What's next in the investigation? 
Well, it almost doesn't matter what the FBI learns because the damage has been done. And now the issue is the company needs to try to get its systems back. There's some reporting that the reason it shut down the pipeline is because if its IT systems are locked up, it can't bill anybody. It can't keep track of what's going on. It also wants to make sure that the ransomware doesn't migrate from IT systems to the operational systems that actually control the pipeline. So right now it's about the company and the cybersecurity firm that they hired, Mandiant, getting in there, getting the attackers out of the system, securing their IT and getting back online. And no one, Joe, that I've talked to is certain when that will happen. Now, Ken, this could really be a wake-up call. These attacks are becoming more and more common and they're raising questions about how vulnerable U.S. infrastructure can be. How can companies try to prevent these ransomware attacks? Well, look, the, the first sort of line of defense is to make sure that employees don't click on bogus links. But that war has almost been lost. It's been shown that no matter how good your defenses are, it's really tough to keep the attackers out. So there's other kinds of strategies about once they get in containing the damage. But big picture, Joe, what we have here are very sophisticated groups attacking key parts of the infrastructure. Many people believe only the U.S. government is going to be able to stop that. And until they raise the costs to these groups and the countries that harbor them, these kinds of attacks will continue. All right, Ken Delaney, and thank you so much. Over on Capitol Hill, Republican Congress <clears throat> Woman, excuse me, Liz Cheney's ouster from party leadership is all but certain after minority leader Kevin McCarthy officially backed a candidate for her replacement. NBC News correspondent Leanne Caldwell joins us now. And Leanne, this is big news. So let's start right there and what the latest is with Congresswoman Cheney. Good morning, Savannah. That's right. Leader McCarthy said on Fox News yesterday that he was going to back the heir apparent, Representative Elise Stefanik from upstate New York. And so the writing is clearly on the wall that it looks like Liz Cheney is going to lose her leadership position for continuing to speak out against the former president and the lies he tells that the last election was stolen. There's expected to be a vote in a closed door meeting of House Republicans later this week. And shortly after that, they're expected to vote in Representative Elise Stefanik. So well, most many House Republicans are saying that they don't want to look backward. They want to look forward toward the 2022 midterm elections. They don't want to keep relitigating the past. Well, for the second week in a row, House Republicans have thrust the former president and the 2020 election back into the spotlight. And we all know that's what President Trump, former President Trump anyway, has been focused on, Savannah. Now, let's talk about some other business on the Hill. One of the next big legislative pushes for Democrats will be police reform. Where do those yeah. talks stand right now and how are they from a bipartisan perspective? Well, Savannah, we're getting awfully close to that May 25th deadline that President Biden had pushed for. Of course, that's the anniversary of George Floyd's death that he wants legislation enacted by Congress was out last week there. Both houses are back in session this week. So we should expect those uh, talks to ramp up. But Representative Jim Clyburn of South Carolina said something really interesting on CNN yesterday, talking about this issue of qualified immunity, which has been a major sticking point between Republicans and Democrats. Let's take a listen and we'll talk on the other side. I will never sacrifice good uh, on the altar of perfect. I just won't do that. Uh, I know what the perfect bill will, will be. We have proposed that. I want to see good legislation, and I know that sometimes you have to compromise. So in that interview, he goes on to say that if they can't get everything they want, especially on this issue of qualified immunity, then they'll come back and do it again. So that could be a big opening that perhaps Republicans and Democrats are on their way to some sort of big compromise. Savannah. Leanne, let's also talk about this inspector general report. So U.S. Capitol Police Inspector General Michael Bolton is testifying to Congress today about that January 6th attack. What might we learn from his testimony? Well, he's going to talk about the third report that they are releasing um, about January 6th. And this is talking about counterintelligence and saying that the Capitol Police did not have the ability to read the, the intelligence because they do not have their own unit. The communications were not up to date. So he is saying that there should, in fact, be its own unit within the police department, spokes, uh, focusing specifically on intelligence and counterintelligence. 
and says that attacks, threats against Capitol Police or the Capitol have been increasing in the past five years dramatically. Savannah. All right, Leanne, lots to cover on the Hill this morning. Thanks so much. Yeah. This morning, investigators in Colorado are looking into what motivated a gunman after a deadly shooting at a birthday party that left seven people dead, including the suspected shooter. It happened just after midnight in Colorado Springs. Police say the gunman opened fire inside a mobile home where several people were gathered before turning the gun on himself. Investigators say the suspect is believed to be the boyfriend of one of the victims. Across the country, states are scaling back on their orders for the coronavirus vaccine as demand for the shot declines. So far, more than 114 million people, a little over 34 percent of the U.S. population, is fully vaccinated. Nearly 46 percent of Americans have had at least one dose of the vaccine. These numbers could start to slow down, though, with fewer doses going out to some states. NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett is following the latest on the pandemic this morning. Maura, good morning. So where are we seeing demand go down and do we think that this is all a hesitancy issue? It is, Savannah. More and more states are experiencing exactly that. As supply goes up, they're seeing kind of a plateau in demand. We're looking at states like South Carolina, Wisconsin, Iowa, Washington. They've all scaled back their weekly allocation requests that they put forward to the Biden administration. And just in this last week alone, that's equaled out to hundreds of thousands of doses. Now, of course, the White House did say last week that any doses that aren't going to some states can be reallocated to other states that do need them. And not all states are scaling back places like Maryland, Colorado, New York City. And here in Chicago, they're still requesting their full allocation week over week, Savannah. Now, more than a million people are still getting vaccinated every day. So at that pace, do health experts believe that will be enough to prevent a fall surge in COVID cases? As we get closer and closer to herd immunity, like we've talked about many times before, getting to that 70% benchmark, health experts are optimistic. I want you to hear Dr. Fauci's take on this. He was on Meet the Press yesterday with our colleague, Chuck Todd. Well, the fact that we have vaccines right now, Chuck, is really a game changer. I mean, if we get, which we will, to the goals that the president has has established, namely, if we get 70 percent of the people vaccinated by the 4th of July, namely one single dose and even more thereafter, you may see blips. But if we handle them well, it is unlikely that you'll see the kind of surge that we saw in the late fall and the early winter. Now, in an effort to get more people vaccinated, federal officials are putting forward more small and mobile vaccination clinics to reach people in more rural places. And some states are even starting to offer these incentives to get people vaccinated. And Maura, Dr. Anthony Fauci also suggested there in that interview, there may be a change to the guidance about wearing a mask indoors. What did he say about that? And when could that possibly take place? So he didn't set a firm timeline, but he did say as more and more Americans get vaccinated and can safely be around each other inside with that mask on, he said that there is a possibility that those guidelines could be loosened. And because he didn't set a firm timeline, we're looking at the numbers. He did note that we're still seeing in the United States about an average of more than 40,000 cases a day. He said that number needs to go way, way down before any of those rules are loosened about wearing masks inside. Now, this also comes, though, interestingly, as the CDC over the weekend redefines some of its guidelines, reminding people that the the risk of airborne transmission with coronavirus is actually more uh, impactful. Even if you're standing more than six feet away from someone, you can still get sick if they are because of that airborne transmission. And initially, obviously, they had issued these reminders and these guidances about that close contact was, was the big thing here. Now they're saying it is that airborne transmission. So all of that obviously coming into play when it comes to wearing masks inside. Absolutely. Mara, thank you so much. Let's bring in Dr. Kavita Patel. She's an NBC News medical contributor. And Dr. Patel, let's begin with that last headline we were just discussing. Would you feel comfortable at all with relaxing indoor masking rules soon? I know how I feel about that, but I'm not the doctor. You are. So I'll ask you to weigh in. Yeah, Joe, it depends on where you are. If I were in San Francisco right now, they've had about 20 cases in their metropolitan area a day, and their vaccination rate is actually higher than 70%. So I would feel more comfortable doing that in a place like San Francisco. I'm in the D.C. area. We're not there yet. And so I do think that as we've all kind of talked about herd immunity, it's not going to be a light switch. It's going to be that kind of dimmer switch in certain parts of the country. But the good news, 
I actually do think by summer we are all going to, as a nation, get there. More vaccinations, less restrictions. That's good to hear. Now, with fewer states or with states ordering fewer vaccine doses, at least some states, how worried are you about the U.S. reaching herd immunity? Do you think it's still possible to get there later this year? I do. None of us are surprised that the demand has gone down because the demand was, quite frankly, insane in the beginning. All the people scavenging to try to get vaccines, et cetera. I think now this game has moved from stadiums to offices like mine where we're trying to get anybody who's coming in and make it as convenient as possible. And to get to those people that have questions that are lingering and they just aren't sure, they need more time and more counseling. And that's the kind of environment that will get us to higher and higher vaccination rates. But we also do need to see those cases coming down. They are coming down, Joe. But I predict in the next four to six weeks, we're going to see incredible freedoms that remind us of pre-pandemic times and also higher vaccination rates. That's good to hear. Dr. Patel, we just heard from Maura about the potential of a fall COVID surge. Some health experts say the serious threat could be a surge of flu cases. Last year, of course, wasn't that bad. The U.S. reported fewer than 2,000 flu cases last fall. We were social distancing, wearing masks. Most people weren't at work. Kids weren't at school in a lot of places. What do you think we're going to see this year when it comes to the flu? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, remember, the flu is kind of also a worldwide phenomenon. So most of the world is still dealing with COVID and hasn't been vaccinated. So I do think, Joe, the truth, even someone like myself is probably going to continue to wear masks in public settings like trains and planes, just because I know it'll help me from getting sick. So we will likely see an increase in cases. That's just statistics. But I don't think it's going to be this kind of pandemic endemic or anything that could cause us to be concerned. We're watching COVID numbers much more closely. And I'd worry more about that coming back if we don't have the booster immunity that we need to probably by the fall or winter. Dr. Patel, I want to talk a little more about trying to get to herd immunity. What do you think is going to be the key? I mean, are we seeing signs that people are who are on the fence are starting to maybe change their mind and lead more toward vaccines? Or where do things stand with that right now? Yeah, they are. And I'll tell you, you know, we've we've seen the most traction, a combination of efforts, like all things. One, addressing their questions and fears and concerns. But then two, Joe, frankly, a lot of people that I've talked to, I've said, this is going to be your ticket to freedom. There's going to be a lot of environments. If you don't have a vaccine or proof of vaccine, getting on an airplane, going to a concert, even thinking about going into a movie theater, which none of us have done in a year and a half actually starts to become more real. So I do hope that, and, and that has been working with people. So I, it's it's a little bit of the star- carrot and the stick approach. You, you can prevent yourself and others from dying, but you can also have some freedoms too, some good things that you haven't done in a while. I know my home state in Minnesota, the governor there is trying the carrot approach. He's saying, hey, we're going to get rid of the mask mandate at a certain point, but if we get to 70% sooner, I will make that change sooner just to try and encourage more people to get vaccinated. So, all right, Dr. Patel, as always, thank you so much. Now to Afghanistan, where grieving families have buried loved ones killed in a blast at a girl's school. More than 50 people died and more than 100 were injured in the attack. NBC's Richard Engel joined the mourners and filed this report from Kabul. On a remote hill above Kabul, flanked by the high Hindu Kush mountains, they came in the hundreds to bury their daughters. With picks and shovels, they dug into the dry ground for the victims of a cowardly attack. Islamic radicals bombed a girls' school yesterday, just as students were heading home. Today, they were laid to rest in a single mass grave. There were so many victims. Health officials say there were more than 50 schoolgirls that were killed. And the reason they were targeted is simply because they were girls trying to go to school. The mourners held tarps to shade the bodies as they prayed for the fallen, many of them under 15. When I asked a group of mourners what they think will happen now as American troops leave, they all predict civil war and an emboldened Taliban. 21-year-old Shah Zaman is a medical student. The Americans should not live here. They're good for Afghanistan. The government cannot control the situation. At the bomb school today, families came to look in horror at the blood-stained books, shoes, and clothing. The girls dropped as they ran from the explosion. 
The Taliban denied responsibility for the attack and today issued a statement telling Afghans they have nothing to fear when they soon take over. The militants believe allowing girls to learn a profession is against Islam. But everyone burying their daughters today is Muslim too. And in chalk by the graves, they wrote one defiant word, education. Richard Engel, NBC News, Kabul. Let's get a check now on your morning news now. Where? Bill Cairns is here. Hey, Bill, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. It looks like you survived the uh, Mother's Day birthday uh, daily double. <laughs> I did, but man, the rain, you weren't kidding. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it did ruin some people's Mother's Day. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful Monday, if that's any, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Isle Valley in the Northeast, uh, you know, the rain did uh, you know, plague us through much of the day. But uh, it's going to be a beautiful week ahead, so maybe you can uh, make up for it. So this morning, the rain is exiting. It's just about gone. The sun is out in most areas of the Northeast. Just a little bit of rain left there in Maine, and the sunshine will be enjoyable this afternoon. Now, unfortunately for the South, it's not going to be quite as easy. We're seeing a lot of thunderstorms now, and we'll continue to see some later today. If we get any wind damage with these thunderstorms, watch out, especially near Newburgh and Greenville, Washington, out through a Hatteras, Kill Devil Hills. We could see some pretty strong storms with some high winds later today. And we may get some big hail storms late today, heading from Del Rio and Laredo and passing towards Austin and San Antonio. Just a hit and miss storm from Dallas to Louisiana today. So as far as the week ahead, so here's where we are today. Kind of cool for May. The Great Lakes temperatures, it's very comfortable. I mean, you're saving a lot of money. You don't, have to need, you don't really need the heat. You don't really need the air conditioning. Uh, the Ohio Valley, the Tennessee Valley through the Northeast. And yes, there is a little bit of snow in the Rockies. Our friends on the West Coast, I don't have any rain at all for you all week long. So, you know, temperatures are warm and it looks like our dry season is here for good now. Down along the Gulf Coast, still Tuesday, Wednesday, more rain for Houston to New Orleans. Flood threat, especially in Louisiana. Sunny and cool, but beautiful from the Great Lakes all the way through the Northeast. Tuesday, Wednesday, notice Thursday, not much is going on. Even Friday, there's no not a lot of wet weather on the map and finally dry in areas of the south and you want to talk about summer heat vegas 98 on friday phoenix is looking like 103 so uh, get ready guys to hear a lot more about the heat this summer and also the drought conditions in the west we just did not get the rain we needed this rainy season mm. and now that the dry season is here you know fire season won't be far behind yeah it's almost year round it seems like these days all right bill yeah, thank really. you so much thanks bill yeah. Coming up, the doping scandal rocking the Kentucky Derby. This year's winner may have been caught cheating. How a horse racing champion could fall from grace next. There's controversy this morning in the world of horse racing. Medina Spirit, the winner of this year's Kentucky Derby, failed a post-race drug test. The horse's trainer, seven-time Derby winner Bob Baffert, says he's shocked by the news. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park joins us live from Churchill Downs. And Kathy Baffert has been suspended from the track indefinitely. What do we know here? Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. So right now we are still waiting for the second test result. So if it comes back positive, Medina Spirit could be the second horse in Kentucky Derby history to lose a title due to a drug violation. The trainer, Bob Baffert, says he did nothing wrong and he's vowing full transparency moving forward. Medina Spirit battles on. On the heels of a record-setting run for the Roses. Bob Baffert does it again. This morning, trainer Bob Baffert suspended by Churchill Downs after Medina Spirit, the colt he guided to glory at last week's Kentucky Derby, failed his post-race drug test. I got the biggest gut punch in racing for something that I didn't do. In a statement, Churchill Downs saying in part, failure to comply with the rules and medication protocols jeopardizes the safety of the horses and jockeys, the integrity of our sport, and the reputation of the Kentucky Derby. Adding, if the findings are upheld, Medina Spirit's results in the Kentucky Derby will be invalidated and Mandaloon will be declared the winner. It's disturbing. It's an injustice to the horse. Baffert, who denies any wrongdoing, revealing Sunday that Medina Spirit tested positive for 21 picograms of the steroid betamethasone, double the legal racing limit in Kentucky. The substance, an anti-inflammatory, was also found in the system of Gamine, another Baffert-trained horse that finished third in last year's Kentucky Oaks race. 
Gamin was retroactively disqualified and Baffert received a fine. The seven-time Derby-winning trainer telling NBC News he didn't treat Medina Spirit with a drug and has requested the horse's split sample be analyzed, along with hair and DNA, to clear him. That's the part that's really disturbing to us is that we don't use betamethasone. It's and my vets don't even carry it anymore. Baffert has faced troubles before. This is his 30th time a horse in his care has tested positive for something. He's had five within the last year now. But the renowned trainer insists he's always followed the rules and is searching for answers. We're giving him everything. We're going to really, really fight hard for this horse. And, and uh, coming up this weekend, go ahead, coming Kathy. up this weekend, of course, <laughs> is another major race in Maryland, the Preakness Stakes. And we are told that Bob Baffert, the trainer, is still moving forward uh, by racing two of his horses, Medina Spirit, as well as Concert Tour. Meanwhile, Maryland horse racing officials are still reviewing all the information surrounding uh, Medina Spirit before making any sort of final decision. But that decision on the cold status could come down as soon as tomorrow. Savannah? Yeah, so Kathy, Medina Spirit is entered into that race, so now we just wait for these results? This morning, more traders are being welcomed back to the New York Stock Exchange floor than we've seen since March of last year. And we're actually just seconds away from the opening bell on this Monday morning. Today, the Stock Exchange is loosening pandemic restrictions. There you see it there. More than a year after coming to a screeching halt, you see there's still quite a few people actually there via video conferencing, but more traders will now be allowed on the floor if they've been fully vaccinated. There goes the bell. <laughs> Just a few seconds before 9.30 a.m. Eastern. This iconic trading floor had actually closed on March 23rd last year, and it stayed fully shut for two months. Since then, it's been operating with limited capacity, but today... You see the mood there looks pretty joyous. More people are returning, being welcomed back in on the floor. We've got MSNBC anchor Ali Velshi, who's right outside the New York Stock Exchange down on Wall Street. Ali, I'm not sure if you can hear or see what's going on inside, but it looks like people are pretty excited to welcome more people back inside, people who have been vaccinated after that closure 412 days ago. Tell us what's happening down there and what work is going to look like for traders who are back. Uh, Savannah, I don't know what they're happy about, whether they're joyous <laughs> about uh, more people being allowed or the fact that the stock market is going to probably hit another record right as it opens. I mean, the, the, the Dow is up 13 percent this year, which is better than you can expect in an entire year. Uh, so there's that that's driving the market. But, yeah, as you said, it's a little bit different right now. As we're expecting to hear that opening bell, you've got uh, more people. You can't see it now because everybody who's a trader on the floor has already gone in. You've got to be at work by the time the bell rings. But you're going to have more people today and every day henceforth because, um, while they have been open since about last May, they've been open on a very limited capacity, a very uh, a reduced number of traders. Um, there are people who come in for the opening bell and the closing bell. Those are typically guests, employees of companies who ring the opening and closing bell. But today they are saying if you are fully vaccinated, you can uh, you can get access to the floor. You can take your mask off while at your workstation, staying six feet away from everybody else. If your entire company, your trading firm is fully vaccinated, you can increase the number of people who are on the floor. Media can come back in there. So it's it's the sense of it getting back to a little bit of normalcy mm. until uh, today. They've been running at about half capacity. Now there is a potential for it to get to higher capacity, almost full capacity. And that's a big deal because this is the sentimental heart of the investor community in America of Wall Street. Things are starting to get back to normal. There's actually a good amount of life out here on Wall Street outside of the exchange, but that's what it is. It's this feeling that things are getting a little back to normal. I will tell you one other thing, Savannah. This, this market is looking strong. You can see this performance. It's up quite a bit today. Ironically, some of that is because uh, energy stocks are up today because they stand to make more money because gas prices are probably going to go up because of that pipeline mm -hmm. uh, closure that we've been talking about. So it's a little bit of bad news for the world, uh, making it a little bit uh, more interesting inside the, on the floor of the stock exchange. Yeah, absolutely. Ali, you mentioned that traders got to be there by 930. I wonder how many are used to that, having to be up and out of the house and actually somewhere. Um, how many right. people did you see going in? I mean, did it feel like a big difference in the number of traders who are arriving? Because there has been that limited capacity over the last few months. Yeah. 
It, it, it doesn't look like a sort of a, a groundswell of people coming in today. I think the point was last late last week, they announced that the restrictions are being lifted. The, the traders are typically, there are very few individual traders. Most of them are members of uh, trading firms. So the trading firms themselves will probably be putting policies in place saying who wants to go back, who's ready to go back, who's vaccinated. Um, if a trading firm doesn't have 100 percent of its staff vaccinated, they might want to get those people vaccinated in order to be able to increase their head count on the floor. So I don't think today was necessarily going to be the big increase, but it's the beginning. It's the door is now open to having more people there. By the way, it's not mandatory that uh, you get vaccinated as an employee of the New York Stock Exchange, and they're not making it mandatory. Mm. Basically, what they're saying is they're encouraging member for firms to do it. If you do it, you'll get more people onto the floor. All right. Ali Velshi outside the Stock Exchange on a big day there. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Two college students from California tried to go to sea in a boat made of two kiddie pools, plywood, some buckets, and duct tape. Believe it or not, that didn't work as planned. <laughs> Santa Barbara officials say the two men, both in their 20s, had to be saved off the coast of Isla Vista when the homemade boat drifted out too far. They couldn't paddle back once they were in the water, so firefighters had to go out and rescue them. Santa Barbara County fire spokesman told the L.A. Times, we managed to bring them back to shore and they were grateful. I just wish they had planned whatever they were doing a little better. Savannah, you know, duct tape is good for many things, but this does not seem to be one of them. Yeah, they put it well, whatever they were doing. <laughs> I don't even like where did they sit? I, I don't very, know. Very strange. Let that be a lesson. Exactly. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Now, this morning, we're learning more about what led to the shocking split of one of the world's wealthiest couples. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin joins us now with more on the developments in the divorce of Bill and Melinda Gates. And Aaron, I know we do have some new details here. Yeah, that's right, Savannah. And while that announcement came as a shock to many around the world, there are media reports that the divorce announcement was actually years in the making. This morning, the Wall Street Journal reporting that Bill and Melinda Gates were negotiating their divorce throughout the pandemic. This morning, new questions are swirling around the state of Bill and Melinda Gates' marriage, leading up to last week's divorce announcement. The Wall Street Journal reporting Melinda began talking to divorce attorneys roughly two years before the filing. The paper citing people familiar with the matter and documents it reviewed. NBC has not yet independently seen or verified those documents. Last week, the multi-billionaires announced in a joint statement they were ending their 25-year marriage because we no longer believe we can grow together as a couple in this next phase of our lives. The journal citing several people reporting that one source of concern for Melinda, a global advocate for women and girls, was Bill's dealings with convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. According to documents obtained by the journal, Melinda and her advisors held a number of calls with divorce lawyers in October 2019, the same month the New York Times first reported that Bill met with Epstein on numerous occasions, starting in 2011, after Epstein had served time for soliciting prostitution. The Times reporting one stay at Epstein's Manhattan townhouse lasted late into the night, according to more than a dozen people familiar with the relationship. In late 2019, Gates was asked about his meetings and relationship with Epstein at one of the paper's forums. You know, I made a mistake in judgment that I thought that, that those discussions would lead literally to billions of dollars going to global health. Uh, turned out I, that was a bad judgment. That was a mirage. None of that money ever appeared. And I gave him some benefit by the association. So I, you know, I made a doubly uh, wrong mistake there. Last week, the Gates shocked the world with news of their broken marriage. In just January, Melinda that. spoke with Savannah about how the two were coping with household duties during the pandemic. Both people can set the table and both people can do the microwaving and the cleaning up. And so we're trying to, again, continue to role model that in our house for our children. Melinda filing for divorce shortly after the announcement last week, according to court documents saying their marriage was irretrievably broken. But according to their divorce filing, they've agreed to a separation contract to divide their massive $130 billion fortune. We've reached out to spokespeople for both Bill and Melinda Gates regarding the reasons for the split, as well as the Wall Street Journal's reporting so far. Both sides or neither side has commented. Guys. All right, Aaron, thank you so much. 
If a beachfront getaway is on your summer wish list, you might be out of luck. Bookings and prices are already skyrocketing. NBC Stephanie Rule has some tips for saving on your summer vacation. As the temperatures heat up, so is summer travel. Americans are itching to get away after being cooped up for a year. 72% say they're planning summer trips, up 37% just a year ago. It's the beach markets that are by far uh, the hottest. Here on the Jersey Shore and in beach towns like Hilton Head and Cape Cod, 90% of rental homes are already booked for the month of July. But it's not only the East Coast seeing a summer boom. Denise Cody is finally rebooking her trip to Hawaii after a year's delay. And she's paying a hefty price for flights. We investigated and uh, waited a little bit for the flights to come down. They did not go down. And rental cars. The rental car situation was a bit shocking. Some rental cars in Hawaii are averaging over $700 a day. With coastlines booked, some people are turning inland and looking for more rural retreats. We will be booked for most of the summer. Jackie Stratton is a new Airbnb host in Maine, looking to cash in, turning her chicken barn into an apartment with a sauna. There's no Wi-Fi. There's barely electricity. It's a very introspective place that I think people feel very comfortable. Most bookings for Jackie's chicken barn happen a week or two before the guests arrive. So your rural vacation awaits. You're getting a very unique space A place with like a soul and spunk. So what are some of the tips if you haven't booked that summer getaway yet? Book it sooner rather than later. There are still deals to be had, but I would say that time is of the essence. The countdown to your summer getaway has begun. Stephanie Rule, NBC News. Coming up, after days of not knowing when or where it would land, debris from a Chinese rocket has crashed back down to Earth. Why some scientists at NASA are calling the whole ordeal reckless up next. Time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. CNBC's Frank Holland is with us this morning. Hey, Frank. Hey, good morning and happy Monday to you guys. We're going to start with some Amazon news. Amazon saying it blocked 10 billion suspected phony listings last year in its efforts to crack down on counterfeits as the e-commerce giant has come under pressure from shoppers, brands and lawmakers alike. Amazon also said it, it destroyed 2 million fake products before they could be sold. More than a year after its debut, Android users in the U.S., they can now join that invite-only app Clubhouse. I'm sure everybody's heard about it. The voice-based social network app quickly gained popularity last year, attracting several celebrities, politicians, investors, and entrepreneurs. Clubhouse's Android arrival comes more than after more than 10 million downloads on Apple's operating system. And Dogecoin plunging nearly 30% after Tesla co-founder and CEO Elon Musk, the self-proclaimed Doge father, He called it a hustle during a skit on SNL. Uh, The cryptocurrency, which actually started off as a joke back in 2013, has really gained a lot of popularity popularity recently, largely because Elon Musk has been tweeting and talking about it. So I know a lot of people that bought some Dogecoin and they were pretty upset after SNL. (laughs) Elon Musk giveth and he taketh away. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) All right, Frank, thank you so much. Across the country, many Americans are reinventing themselves after COVID put their careers on pause. NBC News Now correspondent Issa Gutierrez shares two women's inspiring stories. In Los Angeles, Sydney Gilbert ran her own marketing company pre-pandemic. I was in this wonderful place where I wasn't really marketing myself. Uh, clients were coming in based on referrals um, and it was successful. In Miami, single mom Nicole Wilhite was on the path to a promotion at a major airline. Our lives were meant to change for the way better. But that didn't happen. And then pandemic hit. The airline Nicole works for reduced her hours to as few as five hours a week. And Sydney's business came to a halt. So she took some time to stop and smell the roses and came up with an idea. The only time I could be creative and 
be away from my kids and have a peace of mind was at around 5.30 in the morning at the flower mart where no one was bothering me. I just decided that, you know what, I was going to give myself a weekly budget of about $100 to $150 um, and create small bundle bouquets uh, to sell in my neighborhood. All right, let's go for it. And so she did. Good morning. Thanks for stopping by. Selling bouquets in front of her house. Her business, Backslash Petals. I was really at a point where I was, we were two full-time working parents with dual income, uh, with two kids at home during COVID. Um, and I was just needing to get my hands dirty, uh, creating something. Amazing. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Flowers are really bought to make people feel happy, which is like the greatest joy right now is everyone just wants a little bit of happiness. Can I wrap it for you? And Sydney's business is blooming, selling bountiful arrangements. My large pipe dream is to have my own shop. Back in Miami, Nicole Wilhite and her son Xavier are known as Top Dog. That's the name of the company they created at the onset of COVID. They make homemade organic dog treats out of their kitchen. We're just trying to survive and see what we can do and just taking the opportunity. Carpe diem, right? <laughs> 11-year-old Xavier runs the business. I'm the owner of the company. He first wanted it to earn an allowance. Instead, the small company's profits became a lifeline. Some of it's going towards rent and some of, and some of it's going towards like food so I can eat and my mother can eat. Ironically, Nicole and Xavier don't have a dog of their own, so they take extra care in choosing their ingredients. I have a lot of friends who have dogs, so I just play with them a lot and I figure out what they like. It's all very transparent. Uh, you see all the stuff that she uses. It's like better than some of the stuff I ate at home. The business is booming, and Nicole couldn't be prouder of her son. His motivation has been absolutely amazing. I actually thrive off of his energy. An energy felt throughout the neighborhood. I think she's recognized in the community. Um, people know where to find her. For this mom and son duo, a new career is giving them a new outlook on life. It makes me feel good. Like, um, I can overcome some challenges that I never thought that I could overcome before. Two women who saw opportunity in a crisis, using their creativity and entrepreneurial spirit to start something new. NASA is criticizing China's space agency after debris from one of their rockets crashed to Earth. China claims most of it fell into the Indian Ocean near the Maldives, but U.S. Space Command has not confirmed that. NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey-Fryer has more. This morning, a sigh of relief around the globe as remnants of that out-of-control Chinese rocket are now scattered in the Indian Ocean. U.S. Space Command confirming it re-entered the atmosphere over the Arabian Peninsula. This video appearing to show it flying over Jordan. Chinese space officials, who until Sunday had said nothing about the 23-ton core, put the point of impact here, just west of the Maldives. The danger is over. We were lucky. There was no damage to property, there were no injuries, but it could have gone the other way. China says, as expected, most of the debris burned up on re-entry. But even the slight possibility it could have hit a populated area had the world on alert for days. We don't have a plan to shoot the, the rocket now. Experts seeing it all as a gamble. And in a rare rebuke, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, a former astronaut, accused China of failing to meet responsible standards. The Long March 5B launched the main module of China's space station on April 29th. Unlike most rockets where boosters fall quickly to Earth, this 10-story core went all the way into orbit. This really is an outlier that this particular rocket has an issue that really needs to be addressed. It's happened before. In 2019, debris from another Chinese rocket hit the Ivory Coast. And a spate of other launches here has seen shards and remnants crashing into villages across China. State media here didn't give much attention to this latest rocket saga, and global concerns were dismissed as Western hype. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.